Welcome to this self-learning module on cardiovascular pharmacology. My name is Dr. Michael Lee. In this session, we're going to focus on agents that affect contraction of cardiac muscle, also known as contractility. This is a particularly important issue in conditions such as congestive heart failure. So we'll use the example of congestive heart failure as a foundation for our discussion about the mechanisms of action of these agents. Heart failure is a result of disorders that impair the ability of the ventricles to fill with blood or to eject blood into the circulation. It's really a progressive disorder that involves changes in sympathetic output, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the structure of the heart. We often see remodeling of the heart with congestive heart failure. It involves changes in valves and vessels, together with alterations in the electrical conduction system of the heart. For therapy to be successful, it really depends on the clinical etiology of heart failure and other associated comorbidities. Because the pathophysiology of heart failure involves multiple organ systems, we'll see that the drugs that we talk about act on multiple organ systems. But again, their main role is to affect the contractility of the heart. Just a couple more words about heart failure. Heart failure is caused by a variety of pathophysiologic states such as ischemia, hypertension, and atherosclerosis for example. It's characterized by a decrease in cardiac output, and this in turn disrupts the ability of the heart to deliver oxygenated blood to the tissues. This situation is compounded by well-meaning compensatory mechanisms that are triggered by the body, including fluid and salt retention, changes in heart size, as I mentioned a moment ago, remodeling, also known as hypertrophy, and increased sympathetic signaling to the heart. However, over time, these compensatory mechanisms lead to a worsening of cardiac output and ultimately to myocyte death. Therefore, the therapeutic efforts to help these patients are focused on increasing contractility and stroke volume, decreasing preload, decreasing afterload, lowering blood volume and sodium retention, and stopping the cardiac remodeling process. And I just want to take a second to define preload and afterload. These are new terms that you probably haven't heard yet. Preload is a diastolic filling pressure and it's a function of blood volume and venous tone, whereas afterload is determined by arterial blood pressure and large artery surfaces. The drugs that are used to control contractility and manage heart failure come from many different classes. For example, we see the cardiac glycosides that include digoxin, beta-1 receptor agonists including dopamine and dobutamine, phosphodiesterase inhibitors that include milrinone and enamrinone, ACE inhibitors that include enalapril and captopril, angiotensin receptor blockers that include candesartan and losartan, diuretics such as the loop diuretics like furosemide, or potassium sparing diuretics such as spironolactone, and vasodilators that include a variety of agents such as isosorbide dinitrate, nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, hydralazine, prazosin, and carvedilol. We'll discuss ACE inhibitors. ARBs, diuretics, and vasodilators in more depth in later sessions. So our first class of agents that we want to discuss are the cardiac glycosides. Our prototype is digoxin. Digoxin has actions at the sodium-potassium ATPase on cardiac myocytes. It inhibits the sodium-potassium ATPase, and this leads to a transient increase in intracellular sodium levels. This in turn decreases calcium efflux via the sodium-calcium exchanger which in turn results in increased contractility, which is also known as a positive inotropic effect. Digoxin also has actions on the electrical properties of the heart. It increases parasympathetic or vagal tone and decreases sympathetic activity in the heart. This leads to suppression of AV node conduction, which in turn increases the refractory period, decreases conduction velocity, and decreases heart rate. So when taken together, digoxin is a useful agent for management of heart failure, it reduces symptoms, it increases exercise tolerance in patients, and it reduces hospitalizations. But importantly, it does not actually prolong life. So let's look a little bit more specifically at the mechanism of action of digoxin. As I mentioned, digoxin selectively inhibits the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. This leads to increased intracellular levels of sodium. This in turn inhibits the sodium-calcium transporter which relies on sodium gradients to function. Inhibition of the sodium-calcium transporter leads to increased levels of intracellular calcium, which in turn leads to increased uptake by the sarcoplasmic reticulum via the circa pump, 
and it also leads to increased amounts of calcium at contractile elements. The bottom line is that all of these events lead to increased calcium levels inside the cell and increased contraction of myosin filaments. This is how digoxin increases contractility. And I want to take a second to point out the L-type calcium channel that's playing a central role in this process. We'll talk about calcium channel blockers that affect this channel in another session. So as I mentioned, digoxin also has effects on the electrical properties of the heart. So let's look a little bit more closely at that. Let's compare the action potential of a ventricular myocyte, either untreated or treated with digoxin. Digoxin does two principal things to ventricular myocytes to alter their electrical properties and alter the action potential. The first is that it changes the ERP and the AP. And what are those? The effective refractory period and the action potential duration. And we can see that here in these curves. If we compare the digoxin treated to the control, we see that the action potential duration and effective refractory period are decreased. And we also see that digoxin decreases the resting membrane potential. We'll go into these actions a little bit more in depth later on in the year in Mechanisms of Disease. Ultimately, these actions on electrical properties of ventricular myocytes affect the ECG. On the right-hand side, we see an ECG in a patient that's been administered digoxin. There are some important changes that occur here that are a direct manifestation of what we just witnessed with the ventricular myocyte action potential. First, we see a change in the PR interval. The PR interval is actually increased or prolonged in patients being treated with digoxin. Next we see a change in the QT interval. The QT interval is actually shortened in patients being treated with digoxin. And then finally we see what's called an inversion of the T wave. Again, a characteristic of patients being treated with digoxin. The significance of these changes will have to be discussed later, but the bottom line is that in addition to having very positive effects on contractility, there are some negative aspects on the electrical conduction properties of the heart that actually give rise to arrhythmias or give rise to irregular heartbeats, and that's actually an adverse effect that we see with digoxin. So to really appreciate the effects of digoxin on contractility, Let's look at the inotropic actions of digoxin and the Frank-Starling effect. By enhancing contractility, digoxin actually increases the cardiac output for a given end diastolic pressure. It improves the preload pressure, it improves the efficiency of the heart, and this improvement leads to increased contractility and efficiency and helps alleviate venous congestion and pushes this curve to the left. So digoxin actually helps make the heart work more efficiently. It also has the added benefit of reducing venous congestion, that is blood that's backed up that's not being effectively pumped through the circulation by the heart. Our next class of agents that improve contractility of the heart are the beta-1 adrenergic agonists, such as dibutamine, which is our prototype, and dopamine. These agents, as we've seen in previous sessions, bind to beta receptors, specifically beta-1, leading to increased levels of cyclic AMP, and this in turn increases protein kinase A activation. Protein kinase A then phosphorylates L-type calcium channels, and another protein called phospholambin, which is an inhibitor of the circa ATPase. This leads to increased intracellular calcium and enhanced contraction. Let's look at that a little bit more specifically. We see our familiar sodium potassium ATPase pump, our sodium calcium exchanger, our L-type calcium channel, and the endoplasmic reticulum with the ryanidine sensitive receptor and the circa pump. Let's look at what happens when we add a beta-1 agonist.
So the beta-1 receptor would be here. It acts through G proteins, adenylate cyclase, cyclic AMP, and protein kinase A. This in turn leads to phosphorylation of L-type calcium channels, increased calcium influx, and protein kinase A also phosphorylates phospholambin, which as I mentioned is an inhibitor of the circa ATPase. This leads to further elevations in intracellular calcium. That's more calcium that's available to bind to contractile elements, and that means more contraction of cardiac myocytes. So I mentioned both dobutamine and dopamine. There are some important differences between these two different agents. Dobutamine primarily binds beta-1 receptors, but it has minor actions at beta-2 and alpha-1 receptors. By acting on beta-1, it leads to an increase in contractility and stroke volume. It also has some chronotropic effects on the heart. That is not just the strength of contraction, but also the rate. It leads to increases in myocardial oxygen demand, increases in urinary output, which is secondary to an increase in cardiac output, and it can lead to an increase in AV nodal conduction. Dopamine, on the other hand, while still binding to beta-1 receptors predominantly, also has actions at alpha-1 receptors and D1 and D2 receptors, which are dopaminergic receptors. The actions of dopamine are a little bit different than dobutamine because they depend on the rate of infusion. At a low rate of infusion, we primarily have D1 or dopamine 1 receptor effects, which lead to vasodilation. At a moderate rate of infusion, the beta-1 effects become more predominant, and we get increased contractility and increased rate, that chronotropic effect I mentioned a moment ago. At a high rate of infusion, we get alpha-1 effects, which are vasoconstriction and increased afterload. In addition, dopamine also stimulates the direct release of norepinephrine from presynaptic vesicles. Let's move on to the phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors. The phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors include milrinone and enamrinone. To refresh our memory, phosphodiesterases are enzymes that cleave open and destroy cyclic nucleotides like cyclic AMP. Therefore, inhibition of phosphodiesterases like phosphodiesterase 3, which is found in cardiac myocytes, leads to an increased level of cyclic AMP. This in turn increases protein kinase A activation, and this leads to phosphorylation of L-type calcium channels and phospholambin, which as we saw a moment ago is an inhibitor of circa ATPase pumps on endoplasmic reticulum and cardiac myocytes. Taken together, these actions lead to an increased intracellular level of calcium and increased contraction. Let's look at that more carefully. We have our beta-1 receptors, which are linked to GS, adenylate cyclase, cyclic AMP, and protein kinase A. Normally, phosphodiesterases serve as a control point in this signaling process, and they serve to degrade cyclic AMP. By doing this, it interrupts this signaling cascade and stabilizes calcium levels inside the cell. However, if we inhibit the phosphodiesterases with a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, we get an increase in intracellular calcium levels, increased amounts of calcium at contractile elements, and increased contractility of cardiac myocytes. So as we finish, I just want to take a minute to say a couple words about ACE inhibitors and ARBs and diuretics. Even though we're going to discuss these agents in another session, I think it's worth mentioning them given their central importance in treating congestive heart failure. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are actually first-line agents in treating heart failure because they increase survival. And they do this uh, through a variety of mechanisms, but as I mentioned a moment ago, digoxin, while it improves the symptoms of patients, doesn't actually improve survival. So these agents are really, really important in the therapy of congestive heart failure. They decrease afterload and they promote vasodilation. They reduce left-sided hypertrophy and remodeling, and they're often frequently combined with digoxin or a diuretic. The diuretics, on the other hand, lower left ventricular filling pressure and volume by decreasing preload. They lower myocardial oxygen demand, and they help reduce pulmonary edema in acute heart failure. So those effects can actually be visualized here in a similar graph to what we looked at before, comparing stroke volume to left ventricular filling pressure. So we see a normal curve here, we see a curve for untreated heart failure, the curve for a patient with heart failure that's been treated with an ACE inhibitor, and it actually moves the curve up and over to the left. Inclusion of a diuretic also improves patients with heart failure by helping to move the curve over to the left. So when taken together, these help improve the efficiency of the heart 
and reduce venous congestion, similar to what we saw with digoxin.